This episode of Tape Facts is sponsored by Zombie Granite, the fruit that bites back. Brains. Would you look at that, 18 episodes down. In accordance with British law, the Tape Facts video account is now old enough to buy its first pint, apply for an organ donor card and get its first nudie mag from the corner shop. Weird to think we've got exactly 100 elements left to go before we get to Organesson. Although at my current upload rate, I'll probably be old enough to qualify for state-mandated euthanasia on the NHS. Argon is so unreactive, its name literally translates to idle in ancient Greek. Like all of the noble gases, argon atoms have full outer shells of electrons. This arrangement is extremely stable. And and as argon atoms have no energetic incentives to share their electrons with others, they don't really go for the whole chemistry thing. One of the only argon compounds that has ever been synthesised a few molecules at a time is argon fluorohydride, a compound so unfathomably cursed and unstable it can only be handled at a chilly minus 250 degrees Celsius, which for reference is a bit colder than the freezing point of air, but not quite cold enough for a Geordie girl to put a coat on for a night out. Under standard temperatures and pressures, argon's chemistry is about as lively and vibrant as a bargain hunt to Marathon at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, but sometimes boring elements can be used to our advantage. In synthetic chemistry, it can sometimes be useful to work under an inert atmosphere so your reactants don't, well, you know, react with moisture or oxygen in the air. Nitrogen gas is the cheapest and most common option for this, but if the reaction's being carried out at significantly high temperatures, even the strong nitrogen nitrogen triple bonds keeping the N2 molecules together can be broken. Argon atmospheres are used in processes that require high temperatures, like arc welding or the production of titanium via the Kroll process, which can be carried out at temperatures as high as 850 degrees Celsius. Argon is also denser than nitrogen, which makes it more effective at preventing the dispersion of oxygen or water vapour in the case of a leak. As such, argon is the gold standard in museums for the preservation of delicate artefacts like mummies that might otherwise start to rot. The American constitution has been stored in an argon atmosphere for the past 20 years to keep it in good nick, but the practices of the National Archives haven't always been quite as meticulous. In 1952, the constitution was moved from its home in Fort Knox to a special helium-filled tank to prevent degradation. Now, imagine you're an archivist in the 1950s. The president has put you and your team in charge of preserving one of the most valuable artefacts in your country's history. You come back from your 17th smoke break of the day, only to see that the priceless document you and your team spent thousands of dollars encasing in a special glass box has now been speckled with irremovable white blotches. See, what the bright sparks at the National Archives failed to account for was humidity. On the day the constitution was encased in the tank, the humidity of the air was incredibly high. Once the air from the room was enclosed, airborne water water vapour was absorbed into the parchment, and as it had nowhere to go, it began to slowly react with alkaline compounds in the glass. That's right, fellas, the air itself has turned against the constitution due to infiltration by communists! You might remember from a previous episode that most quote-unquote neon signs are actually filled with argon, as it's by far the cheapest of the noble gases. But did you know you can also find argon in lighting equipment that wasn't taken from strip clubs? The filament in household light bulbs is usually made out of tungsten, a metal with both a bright glow and the highest melting point of any element on the periodic table. You probably know that in order to make metal glow, you have to heat it up. What you might not know, however, is just how unfathomably hot it gets inside a light bulb. Tungsten filaments can reach temperatures as high as 3000 degrees Celsius, only a few hundred degrees cooler than the surface temperature of a literal red dwarf star. To prevent the tungsten from immediately oxidising in the air to form tungsten trioxide, a reaction that would be very bright but would burn out the filament in about 2.6 millishakes of a lamb's tail, light bulbs are filled with a mixture of argon and nitrogen gas to sustain the glow for as long as possible. As well as being the most common noble gas in air, argon was also the first of the bunch to be discovered. As with neon, krypton and xenon, William Ramsey contributed to the discovery, this time with his scientific partner Lord Rayleigh, or John William Strutt if you want to stick it to the aristocracy. At the time of argon's discovery, Rayleigh was in his 50s and had already made a name for himself in scientific circles. After graduating at the top of his class from Cambridge in 1865, he spent most of the 1870s trying to work out why the sky was blue, which in hindsight really seems like one of those problems that should have been figured out much earlier, but 100 50 years ago, no one had any convincing answers. Why specifically blue, and not some other colour like yellow or purple or mole's breath? And yep, that's its real name, thank you colour charts. Rayleigh worked out that when sunlight reaches the Earth, it gets scattered in all directions by gas molecules in the upper atmosphere. Blue light has a shorter wavelength than other colours, so it travels as shorter, smaller waves. This short wavelength is what makes blue light much easier to scatter, which is why 
why most of the time the sky appears blue. This phenomenon is known as a Rayleigh scattering in his honour. By the time the 1890s had rolled around, chemists had known for the existence of nitrogen for decades, and they learned how to efficiently extract N2 from the atmosphere. They'd also figured out that certain biological reactions release nitrogen gas as a byproduct, and they'd learned how to measure the amounts produced from these reactions with incredible precision. But William Ramsey noticed the masses weren't adding up. Nitrogen gas from the atmosphere was very slightly heavier than nitrogen from reactions, about half a percent more, give or take a decimal point or two. Ramsey correctly deduced the samples of atmospheric N2 weren't naturally heavier, just impure. Alongside the nitrogen gas, the samples had been mixed with an unreactive, heavier gas. With Rayleigh's help, he was able to isolate the impurity by reacting off all the other carbon dioxide, nitrogen and oxygen in a sample of dry air. What was left was an inert, colourless gas, and the rest is history. Argon doesn't have much in the way of flashy reactions. It doesn't explode, it isn't poisonous, and you can't set people on fire with it. Still, keeping bits of parchment from the 18th century from rotting is certainly a niche, so don't give up boring people, for you too can contribute to society. Maybe you can write a poem about your stamp collection. Maybe you can compile a 900 page treatise on the history of lettuce. Or, I don't know, make an artsy collage at your favourite photos of John Major. <laughs> <laughs>